Hey, Sherelle, I'm not sure you can see me anymore. For some um, reason. Your, your um, camera is not on. What's that? Your camera. Yeah, be working. I'm going to try to come back on. Okay. Sorry about this. We're going to loop the video one more time. And then once the video stops, we'll get started.
All right. Thanks, Pharrell. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is McElvey Neal, Managing Editor at the Haitian Times. And tonight, we're happy to present or to be with you on Zoom and on Instagram Live for the first time. We're doing IG Live, so bear with us if there are any technical difficulties. Um, but before we get into the panel tonight, just wanted to really share with everyone how it's been a tremendous year for us at the Haitian Times and to say thank you for all of your support throughout the year. Um, we're really coming into our own as a publication for the Haitian community. And I just wanna thank everyone who's been with us throughout the year supporting us and encouraging us to continue. Um, with that said, as I said, we are looking at tonight, the panel we're calling you know, Haiti 2021, our year in review. It's really been a really crazy year for, for Haiti, for Haitians everywhere in Haiti, in the US and everywhere else that we are um, living as a diaspora. So instead of choosing one topic like we do with our monthly conversations, we thought it made sense to just go through the entire year and have some perspectives added um, from our esteemed panelists whom I'll introduce shortly. And then maybe wrap up the end of the night if we have time with some um, suggestions from them and some from you, if possible, on how we can move forward as a community and as a country. Um, as you know, from January through today, actually, we've just had back-to-back -back news out of Haiti every single month. It's just back to back to back. And um, right now we're dealing with the tanker truck explosion in Cap Haitien um, yesterday that killed 75 people that we know of. We've heard that in Port de Pied, there's been another incident involving a fuel truck and we're following that um, as well. And we'll be posting it on HaitianTimes.com as soon as we get the verified information for you. Um, before I introduce the panel, I would, I know that because this is something we're following very closely. I know that Leonie Armantin, who represents St. La Haitian Neighborhood Center in South Florida, her group just sent out a message um, just sharing what you know, we know so far as a community about this terrible tragedy in Cap Haitien. So Leonie, if you'd like, do you wanna share with folks where and how um, they can help if they'd like to? Thank you. Um... Uh, yes, you know, South Florida is the home to many, many, many people from the north, the north, northwest. So it's a real tragedy for us. Uh, we have a community that that's grieving, uh, not just the losses of lives, but the destruction of their beloved, you know, historic city. So uh, Santla uh, does not raise money. We don't raise money for Haiti. And so we usually partner with other organizations and direct, you know, our friends and supporters to donate through their site. So um, we, there are many efforts right now. There are cash app donations. There is a GoFundMe. Uh, but for us, you know, we prefer to direct uh, people to um, bona fide, you know, 501c3s and, you know, who have transparency, who do annual reports. And, and, and so we are directing all, directing all donations to the IT Community Trust, um, which is an organization created, founded five years ago by um, Gerda, Dr. Gerda Nicola. Is, she's a scholar, community activist, you know, someone that we respect for her leadership and scholarship so we ask and she's sort of created the uh, um, uh, you know a link that uh, you know people can go donate and specify that it is for keep Haitian and most of the funds right now are targeting the hospitals because we know that with the explosion last week in Trou du Nord and the explosion this week in Ocap um, the hospitals are normally full to capacity 
but are lacking, again, some of the most basic uh, supplies. So definitely there's an urgent need for supplies for the, the hundreds that have been wounded both in Cap Haitien and in Trou du Nord. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leonie. So as you heard it, if you know, you'd know you like to help folks in OCAP, Cap Haitien, as we say, go to ietcommunitytrust.org, I believe, or Google it yes. and see and um, contribute if you can or try to find some way to help if that's where your heart is. Um, with that said, I'd like to introduce our panel and then get into it just really quickly, sort of month by month, what we've been going through as a community and just reflect a little bit to wrap up the year. Um, our panel today, since Leonie, I had you come on, I'll introduce you. Ms. Leonie Hermonte is the Director of Development Communications and Strategic Planning at Santla, as we mentioned. Um, the organization's mission is to empower, strengthen and uplift the Haitian American community of South Florida. If you've ever been to Miami or South Florida, you've heard of Saint La. So thanks for continuing to do that work, Leonie. Um, personally, she has worked in grassroots organizations in both the US and Haiti, including the Lumbee Fund of Haiti. And she's consulted with a number of groups, including the Children's Trust, Focal, and FIU, my alma mater there. So Dev. And for Dev, yes. <laughs> Leonie holds a Juris Doctorate from UC Berkeley and a master's degree in urban and environmental planning. So really she's had experience just across the board with a range of organizations and we're just so thankful to have her doing her thing um, with the Haitian community in Florida and really throughout the US. So thank you, Leonie. Um, next we have Dave Fizeme. Dave Fizeme is in Haiti right now. He's the founder and executive director of Basketball to Uplift the Youth and the founder also and president of Dali Real Productions. It's a multimedia company that really tries to tell a different version of the Haitian narrative that some of us are so familiar with through mainstream media. Um, Dave holds a master's degree in human development and psychology from Harvard University and a bachelor's in political science from Yale University. Dave has worked with the UN Development Program and the UN Foundation and the Embassy of Haiti in Washington, DC over his career. In 2012, he launched Basketball to Uplift the Youth as a tool to educate and mentor underprivileged youth in Haiti. Um, last year in 2020, Dave returned to Haiti to devote himself full-time to this organization, which is based in Martissant, a hotspot as you all um, may know of just gang activity and a lot of security or insecurity issues um, in Port-au-Prince. So thank you, Dave, for making it. And um, congratulations on your recent appearance in San Francisco last week, I believe. You can tell us a little more about that in a while. Uh, Dr. Regine Michel jean charles last but not least, is a Black feminist scholar who works at the intersections of race, gender, and justice from a global perspective. Her scholarship and teaching include works on Black France, African diasporic literatures, Caribbean studies, Haiti, and of course, the Haitian diaspora. She is currently the Dean's Professor of Culture and Social Justice, as well as the Director of Africana Studies at Northeastern University. She has authored more than 30 publications over her career, and I personally am looking for her next book, forward to her next book coming out next year. It's titled, Looking for Other Worlds, Black Feminism and Haitian Fiction. So welcome, Dr. jean Charles. Thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure, of course, to see you all again. Um, so thank you so much. I see people are excited to have you guys on. They may be familiar with you from your past um, appearances with us, as they should be. All right. So let's get into it. The year started off with a bang. Um, in Haiti, the first three months, January, February, and March, we saw a lot of um, debate and controversy is how we opened up the year around Jovenel Moïse's term and when it would end. Um, <laughs> some people said it was February, 2021. He maintained it was 2022. And so we saw that political um, theater just play out with constant debates and just back and forth. 
And then this kind of fear of what February 7th would mean once that date um, came on the calendar. So Dr. Joshua, let me start with you a little bit. Can you add just some context around what that debate was about and just kind of walk us through what was going through your mind or other scholars' minds as we watched this back and forth between 21st, 2021 and 2022 as the end date? Sure, absolutely. First, I have to say thank you so much um, for having me here. Um, you know, Leonie is someone that I consider a mentor that I uh, met many years ago for the first time when I was in graduate school. So it's an honor. It's always an honor when you can be on a panel with someone um, whose trajectory you've admired and whose contribution you admire so much. And for the Haitian Times, you know, you said you're coming into your own, but I'm you all are firmly in your own. So I'm so grateful for the work that you all do there. Um, and just the voice that you've been able to have this past year, especially. So congratulations to you on, on a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a year that has had many ups and downs, mostly downs, right, for us. But it is always a blessing when you can see um, something about IET shining, right? I remember, I think about uh, Jessica Genius's recent film, for example, and I was sharing it with some friends and we were like, this is the only positive news about Haiti that we see these days. <laughs> so thank you. I, I consider the Haitian times in that light. Um, Yes, so I will start this with the caveat that I am not a historian. I'm a literary scholar and a cultural critic. <laughs> um, but of course, history and knowledge of history informs all of the work that I do. So just, you know, about the, the opposition, the term and what was happening with the term earlier in the year. Um, so there were those that said that the five year term should have ended on February 7th, on February 7th in 2021, five years to the day, right, since um, his Michel Maltelli, who was the previous president, stepped down. Um, but but what he was saying is the reason why that his, his term should have been extended was because he did not actually take office until 2017, right? And so I think that that's, um, in, that's important because of, first of all, the reason why he didn't take take office was also because we knew that there were these allegations of fraud going on, right? Um, and I think that, you know, when you look at the history of the country, we know that there have been these debates around um, presidential terms. Uh, we know that there have been um, there have been instances where there's this kind of lack of clarity, right, around uh, whether or not a term should begin or whether or not a, a, a president should, should take office. And I think that that's, that to me, I saw those debates as really fascinating from the point of view of uh, kind of looking at it from a historic perspective, but also from the political scientist perspective, and also from the general kind of telejol perspective, right? Um, you know, you had a lot of people kind of weighing in very exuberantly, very passionately, that this should absolutely, you know, that this is, that this would be, a, you know, a disaster, right? If he, he should step down, he should absolutely step down. But, you know, where I always really try to align myself and think about is, what are kind of the progressive voices on the ground um, and how are people were organizing, right? So I think that as we think about that movement, right, um, that we know started with, you know, the Petro Caribe questions and the money surrounding that, but this movement that was also using that to say, to galvanize in their, in their opposition to Moise, right? So I think for me, that's kind of what I look to as my true North. Um, and yes, I'll leave it at that. I'll let others come in. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, you were in Haiti at the time or had been there for about a year. Um, what were you hearing? How were people trying to process that? Was it as big a deal as we saw just from following the news from abroad? Were everyday people concerned about when Jovenel Moise's term would end or not? What was your um, experience with that whole confusion? Uh, it was definitely on everybody's mind, um, especially in a country where we'd had an extended period of uh, pay luck for about uh, three months or so. And when you don't have pay luck, you have a recurring protest. So um, a lot of folks were definitely um, already discussing what was to happen already in 2020. Um, I remember one um, politician, for example, uh, Jerry Talzu, the former um, Deputy of Pétionville, um, and his end of year address that he did, um, he predicted that 2021 would be an even tougher year for Haiti than 2020. And one of the main reasons was uh, because of the questions regarding uh, the uh, timing of the end of uh, Jovenel Moïse's uh, presidency. And so, yeah, everywhere you go, um, from you know being in the streets or being in a restaurant, 
uh, you'd hear folks debating um, over it and more importantly, fearing what would happen. And I remember um, myself a couple of days before February 7th, um, we had a Haiti All-Star Celebrity game that my organization did in January, and we had players, um, Haitian celebrities like Mika Ben, Ms. Tijan, even former U.S. Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan played in this game here in Haiti, and er everyone was wearing blue and red. And you know, I tried to do my part and you know shared pictures of everyone wearing blue and red and being united uh, to share on social media, saying that uh, regardless of our um, you know, differences uh, politically, we have to remember that, you know, we're one country and um, not to burn down the country on February 7th. And, um, you know, hope, um, thankfully that didn't happen. And, you know, in the ensuing months, there's still continued debate um, about it. And then it's, you know, eventually uh, we got to July and the president was sadly assassinated and, you know, let, and it led to another crisis. Another Yep, and for folks who are still asking like what the root cause was of the issue, I think Regine touched on it just a little bit. The issue is that Michel Matali stepped down in February, 2016, and there was an election, there was a transitional government in place while the country looked for, to elect a new leader. That new leader wasn't elected, well, debatable, <laughs> until the end of 2016 and he took office in February 27th, 2017. So in his mind, in his supporters' minds, so just if you do simple math, five years, 2017 to 2022, that's five years. But some people who opposed him and you know, who were constitutional stalwarts, I guess, they insisted that the, the term, his term should have really started at the time the presidency became vacant in 2016 and so they demanded that he step down um, this year in 2021. Anyway, this is all just really um, a good example of how we can get into tit for tat and people call on different versions of the constitution to um, give credence to their claims and no one really could figure out who was right or wrong because everyone had a leg to stand on in some way shape or form. But that's the classic um, go ahead, Leonie. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out is it was also the beginning of the schism between folks in Haiti, the progressive folks in Haiti and the diaspora, mm -hmm. because there was there was an increasing um, movement saying, well, it's not five years, you know, people who just didn't understand uh, that constitutional scholars had spoken and that you know, uh, the president was not a constitutional scholar and, and nor were they. So that was kind of the beginning. I noticed that people in the diaspora were, you know, really coming down on the side of the president saying, you know, his term should end on 2022. Mm, okay. Well, we see how it ended ultimately, sadly, as Dave pointed out, um, as that was, but February 7th did come around soon after, obviously. And there was, um, uh, I guess you can call it some sort of invasion of the National Palace that happened on February 7th. And um, Jovenel Moïse said it was an attempted coup. They tried to um, you know, get him out and they failed. And this group of about two dozen people were arrested. And <laughs> so that's how, what we woke up to on the morning of February 7th, I think that early, um, that early morning. So something did come to pass, Dave. It wasn't as calamitous as folks feared, at least when we're, we're sitting. Do you want to weigh in a little bit on what that was like when you all? I, I just there? remember, I mean, in Haiti, we um, experienced so many um, sad moments. And at times, we just tried to find um, laughter, I guess, in these sad moments. And I just remember just folks just laughing about the ridiculousness of the whole situation on that day. And especially since you had expected something really bad to happen. Right. And you saw that it was a completely, um, you know, not well-organized coup attempt that happened. And, you know, and people were like, wow, the Haitian National Police was actually able to uh, dismantle a coup attempt. <laughs> that's, that's surprising. So it was more of that happening. We just right. this last power right now. <laughs> oh, <it's> 80. <laughs> That's normal. We understand. 
But, yeah. you know, speaking of um, the police, I think that's a good way to segue into what we saw in March. Like we saw a lot of massacres just take place in Matissa, where your organization is based in Bel Air yeah. and Cité Soleil. And it was just like, what's going on? Um, I think even the PNH, they tried to um, dismantle some gang activity there and ended up losing quite a few officers. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what that was like. So I think that's when people started saying, hey, what's going on? And we saw things like hashtag Haiti start to trend. That's Dave or Regine, you can um, weigh in because I know Twitter was really busy with these activities taking place in the capital. Regine, feel free. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, oh, sorry. I mean, I think, Again, you know, we know that the when when it comes to the the increase in the kidnappings, um, that that is something that um, you know had been occurring, right? But that it when it, it, there are these periods, we know that they flare up and it intensifies and it becomes extremely unbearable. Um, and I think that you know, I, I know personally, you know, I have a he would be so mad if he heard me say this, but my father is elderly <laughs> and he lives in Port-au-Prince. <laughs> He's, I'm not going to disclose his age, but he's certainly elderly. Um, and, you know, I, I again, he, I, he's someone who, no matter what's happening, you know, he, he moved back, oh, let's see, right before I got married. So almost about 20 years ago. And um, he's never someone who's, you know, he was never... He was very fearless, right, in terms of his goings out. And so I always used him kind of as my barometer, right? Because I'd be like, oh, well, if he thinks, you know, because people will say all the time, oh, it's dangerous, it's dangerous. And I right. say, well, you know, every place is dangerous depending on who you are, right? Mm -hmm. um, just personally, you know, I feel that there's some parts of the deep south that I would go to in the United States that are very dangerous for me as right. a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I did notice, um, you know, and I'm just going to speak personally here, but just the shift also for him in terms of how he was he felt that his mobility was being constrained and some decisions that he made. I mean, I remember even there was one time where my, my mother was supposed to come to the U.S. earlier this year. And it was the question was, well, can, is it safe for us to go to the airport? You know, and so I think that, again, like it's really easy in the diaspora, I think, for us to kind of think about these things and intellectualize them. Um, but they are just real consequences on the ground for people. Right. And thinking about what does that mean for someone's day to day mobility? Right. Like I have, you know, I, I was talking to a friend the other day that told me that you know, her kids, they can't even play in their yard anymore. The kids are not even allowed to go outside in their yard, right? For fear of um, some of the bullets, you know, that have been flying there. And so what does that even mean, like, you know, for a child at that time, right? To think about um, the real cost of, of uh, the kidnapping and its effects on the day, on the day-to-day -day life. And of course, you know, the one that I, I think about really often is someone, and this happened in 2020, but I think a lot about Evelyn Sincere. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, how it later came out that her boyfriend was involved in that. And so what we know for those of us that study gender-based violence or look at these things from a feminist lens, that there's always a kind of compounded effect right when we think about women and girls and we think about this through the lens of gender-based violence and so the question is you know if you're a domestic if you're a domestic abuser and you you know are planning to kill your wife it's actually quite easy now for you to make it look as though your wife was kidnapped right and then killed as opposed to um you know in that way you're able to so i think again there are different ways in which the the I hate the term culture of impunity because I feel like it's like so negative, right, but right. there are ways in which the widespread impunity, I think will have kind of gendered effects as well that we need to think about um, as we as we consider the layers here. Mm -hmm. And Makovi, I'd like to add that, you know, mass massacres have occurred in Haiti for time immemorial. Right. And I think that what, what has happened um, in the past two, three years is that you have a group of really brave people in Haiti who not just who are not just documenting it, but keep them in our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk about because usually if one person dies, you know, in Montaigne, it's a big drama, but if 50 people die in Montissa, it's right. just a flip because then they have no names, no recognition. And I think that we saw a shift in that also. That 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 people begin to uplift, you know, the cries of mothers who lose their children, who've been displaced. So that's an important shift. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point, Leonie, because um, 
the crisis in Martisa um, really got worse uh, from June 2nd, when the gangs uh, really began fighting each other there. And folks weren't really talking about it much, right? Mm -hmm. Aside from a, a few articles in the international media. And then you had the presidential assassination happening um, in July, and it just completely made people forget about the situation in Martisa. Then right. Europe in August, then migrant prices, everything. And you've had uh, over 20,000 people from Martisa completely displaced. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these people are dying literally on a daily basis on, in Martisa. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you had a young lady uh, just last week uh, who was killed in front, of the, um, in front of the Doctors Without Borders office. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't, there are no articles in Luna Velisa about these casualties. It's really folks passing by, you know, now at, at least with, you know, phones, we're able to get information that we normally probably wouldn't have access to, you know, folks filming and that's being shared uh, via um, WhatsApp. And that's how we find out about these things. But these things are happening on a daily basis um, here. And yesterday, one of the gang leaders, um, Izo from um, Village de Dieu, had publicly shared that um, he would allow people to bypass the Bisotnea area to, to get to Maltiso and uh, had a practice session with some of our kids this afternoon and they were telling us that, yeah, they knew that, um, you know, he could not be trusted with his declaration. And uh, what happened actually today was a lot of people who thought it was safe to go now and these guys targeted them, you know, stole, um, you know, motorcycles, took vehicles and, you know, just um, robbed people of, of the things they have. And that's the situation that people are in. And, uh, um, Montisa and Bisotnea and Fotagma area are dealing with on a on a daily basis. Wow. What I find interesting from the perspective of the diaspora, if I may, is that when, when there is an earthquake, when there's any natural disaster, everyone flocks. You know, we have to go, we have to bring supplies, but we're still talking about 20,000 internally displaced people mm. in this community. 10,000 of whom are children under the age of five. And it's still very quiet on the yeah. whole front here. Yeah. No one wants to talk about it. Yeah. No yeah. one wants to send supplies. That disturbs me greatly. Yeah. Can I ask you, Leonie? I'm sorry, I'm not following the script, but no, why do you think that is? <laughs> why do you think that is? I mean, I have my own theories, but I'm curious to hear your perspective, why you think that is. Well, you know, these are long-term problems. These are, these are things that cannot be cured by just one photo op trip to go bring supplies, take pictures, feed people, you know, take your blood pressure, give you some medicine, and then go home. And, for, and furthermore, these are things that are in a geography of violence. And so, you know, no one wants 